Uh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that was, that's my major task for the evening, is to push that little button. <laughs> There's somebody reminding me of it several times. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, if you, uh, I, I have not yet achieved enlightenment, uh, but, and I'm not sure I'm working on it either. I think, uh, it, uh, I hope it kind of finds me. You know, maybe as I go through life, uh, enlightenment will come. Uh, when Lillian called earlier, uh, to say that, uh, I guess to make sure I was coming is why she called. Uh, and uh, she said that she was working on an introduction and it was going to be a good one. And uh, it was a good one. Uh, thank you. And I was, uh, so, but I was wondering, you know, I was kind of thinking on the way over this business of introductions. And I was thinking about how in that older world of California Indians, uh, people didn't really introduce themselves very much. And they didn't introduce themselves very much because for many people it was a world without too many strangers. That we live in this uh, world of so many people and we're constantly strangers to one another. And we have a whole way of introducing strangers and talking to strangers and um, uh, many people, I think, probably have about a two-hour act that uh, they run out and uh, they go from person to person on it. Uh, and those old, that older world was a much more intimate world. People lived in smaller communities and people really knew each other and they didn't really introduce each other very much. They didn't have to introduce themselves. And I was thinking about it how when uh, the first anthros came through at the turn of the century and they would interview some of the uh, elders that had grown up in the world before the coming of Europeans, and they would ask them something like, tell us about your life. A lot of these old timers didn't know how to talk about their life. They didn't know how to organize their life for a stranger. They didn't know how to introduce themselves. They didn't know what facts to present. They didn't exactly know how to, you know, like what do you say? when you live in a world in which everybody knows you. And uh, it's very often very chaotic as to what exactly they would say because they just didn't have that well-practiced manner of saying, hello, my name is such and such and I was born at such and such a place. The, um, there was one person that introduced himself, I was uh, amazed by this, that we tend to introduce ourselves by starting at the beginning. I was born here and I did this and I did that and I wrote this book and that book and uh, published this and now I'm here. We kind of work from the past all the way up to the present uh, as if we wanted our um, story to somehow or other duplicate the way we perceive of time. So we kind of uh, have that. Uh, a lot of people in those old days introduced themselves backwards. Uh, they would start talking about who they were today. And then they would kind of work their way back into the past. And I always thought that was a wonderful thing. I keep thinking that if I were to write a history of uh, the San Joaquin Valley or a history of anywhere else, I would love to write it backwards because that's actually the way we think about things, that for us the present is really big and then the past is kind of distant and we tend to see that past through the present. And I think it's very important in talking about Indian stuff, as uh, Lillian said, that there is a presence of uh, people here today. And the more I get into being a publisher, the more I get into publishing news from Native California, the more I tend to see the past through the present and through the people that are here today. And it's the reverse of, I think, the way history is usually presented. Usually you'll have this big statement about what things used to be like, and then it kind of dwindles and trickles off and then it uh, virtually disappears. But for me, there's a tremendously vital presence that's still here that I have uh, uh, think about. And uh, it kind of is the filter through which I tend to see the past. And I think I'll just start a little bit from that present, and then I'll jump into what I think people are here for, which is a sense of what the uh, Central Valley was like. And then I'll work my way back to the present. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I do publish this uh, magazine called News from Native California. And we just got the latest issue off to the printer, so it's very much with me. The first article that's in it, 
And it's a wonderful thing to publish a magazine because it's like each one of them, it comes out every quarter, and each one of them is a gathering together of people and photographs and ideas, and it has a kind of um, almost a temporary community like summer camp or something. And uh, kind of people and, and ideas come together, and then it's over. And then you start another one, and different people and different ideas come together, and it kind of forms, and it kind of actualizes itself, and then it's over. And uh, there's a sense we just got the last issue to the printer, a bit late as always. But um, uh, the first article is by a woman, a Hooper woman, Vivian Hailstone. And she talks about, she's in her 70s, and she talks about being raised by her great-grandmother, her great-grandmother was born in 1840. So this woman, Vivian, was raised by somebody who remembers, and Hooper Valley is up in Northwest California. She remembers having learned when she was a kid, she was learning from somebody that remembered that old California before the coming of Europeans. And there are many members of an older generation around today who are in their 70s, who are in their 80s, who when they were kids, knew these people who remembered the Central Valley, who remembered California before the coming of whites. Uh, and it's not, we tend to think of that history as so long ago. And yet, I'm, I was born in 1940, I'm uh, 52. I was born in 1940, and I, I amaze my kids no end by telling them and reminding them that when I was a kid, I knew several people that could still remember the Civil War. And I think that I can see there are other people in this audience that also would have known people that could remember the Civil War. And I remember there was one lady that lived in the part of Boston where I grew up, Mrs. Fields. And she remembered when she was a little girl making blankets for her brothers that were fighting in the Grand Army of the Republic. They were fighting down south. And she also remembered that when she was a little girl, she knew people that remembered the American Revolution. So this, what looks like people that treat that old world of the San Joaquin Valley, the world when the Yokuts Indians lived here, the world of villages, of Thule houses, of chiefs and of messengers and of people living and fishing and hunting and all of that, people that want to treat this as something in the distant, distant past, it wasn't. We're talking about something that is a lifetime and a half ago, a couple of lifetimes ago, and not very necessarily terribly long lifetimes either. We're talking about something that is just right out there. And it's still alive very much in the memories and in the mannerisms and in the knowledge of people today. The next article is an article that's an interview with a Pomo man from Santa Rosa, a guy by the name of Bun Lucas. And Bunn talks about uh, his relationship with the animal world. And he talks about how in the old days, people would put on the bear outfit. They would put on the skin of a bear. And in that guise, they were able to travel fast. They were able to get to the coast in no time flat. They were able to go places. They had tremendous powers, and they could go places by putting on this bear skin. And then he made the most wonderful statement. He said, we don't have it today because we don't need it anymore. We have automobiles. And I thought that was just great, that he would, the way he was able to look at that past as something like people, you know, people still eat acorn, but it's not the main part of their meal. They don't live in Thule houses, that things have changed. But it doesn't invalidate that old world. The new world has changed, but that old world is still there. And I was thinking about uh, this whole business of people changing into bears. I remember I was once talking to somebody from the southern part of the valley, from the Thule River Reservation. And we were talking about all kinds of ordinary things. We were talking about cars, we were talking about people, we were talking about jobs, we were talking about uh, uh, sports, although I'm not too good at that, but he was, we were talking about all kinds of ordinary things. And in the middle of all of this kind of conversation, he casually mentioned that there was a place near the reservation uh, where there was a river there, and people used to go from the village they would walk across the river 
and they would come out on the other side as bears. And then they would spend their day out in the woods as bears, and then they would come back and they would go through the river and they would come back into the reservation, uh, in, into, into the village as people again. And then we went back, I mean, without a break, right? Without, as, as if nothing unusual had been said. We then went back and talked about people and friends and uh, cars and all of the rest of that sort of thing. Well, let me take off from there a little bit because, um, and let's leave a, aside for a second. It's kind of, you know, the, the question of whether people do turn into bears. Um, I suspect there are people in this room that are not going to take this one too easily because our culture has a sharp line between people and bears. <laughs> I mean, there's, uh, we're people, they're bears. <laughs> and they don't meet. I mean, that's it. <laughs> that's it. But I want to talk about, um, as we talk about the Central Valley, as we talk about the people that have lived here for so long, what is that quality of mind that allows you to think that way? What is that quality of mind that instead of seeing yourself as this separate human entity with a line that divides you from other species of animals and from plants, to allow yourself to see yourself as made of the same thing, having the same consciousness, and at times even able to move from one into the other. Uh, what is it like to see the world that way? And it's a world, it's not that Indian world is without boundary. There isn't, there's, there's very strong boundaries as to what can be done and what cannot be done and uh, uh, when things can be done. But there are boundaries that are drawn in a different way from the way the dominant culture has its boundaries. And uh, one of those things that the distance between people and other species, the way the landscape was constructed, after Europeans came to the Central Valley, there was a, boundaries were created that whereas at one time it was a massive swampy area, one of the things that the dominant culture loves is it loves to have nice deep water that flows or solid land. So you get into dredging, you get into filling, you get into property lines, you get into uses of land, you get into a sense of zoning, that this land is agricultural, this land is pasture, this land is to lie fallow. You get into a property line as opposed to the, the Indian way of thinking where they didn't have really property lines. People had rights in certain places. A family had collecting rights on that tree, but some other family might have had the rights to gather the clover that was in that same area. And you had these kind of, it was a much more porous kind of thing. And the landscape wasn't that clear distinction between land and between water, between mine and between yours, between animals and between people. And it was a much more porous, a different kind of world. I was thinking about uh, how in the world to describe that old world. And, um, and fetching around because, um, it's not that I know a tremendous amount. Uh, it's that I've been studying and thinking about these things for close to 20 years now. 20 years ago, I was able to say things with a lot more surety and clarity than I can now. <laughs> uh, 20 years ago, I seemed to have much stronger ideas. The more I get into these things, the more complex Indian life becomes, the more anything you say there's an exception to it. You kind of move around, and I think that if I learn any more, I'll probably be able to say absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, that is not enlightenment, that is, uh, that's something else. Uh, the, um, so I was thinking about how to uh, walk into that central valley of uh, 150 years ago, of how to view it and of what to do. And I was looking over some of the old accounts, and I came onto an account that I'd almost forgotten about. And it was an account of a guy named Thomas Jefferson Mayfield. Do people know this account? Yeah, boy. Um, there was an old school teacher. A, a kind of this self-taught guy named Frank Lotta. And Frank Lotta was obsessed with the Yokuts Indians. And he went around every weekend, he talked to some of these old timers, he got their histories, he uh, wrote everything, he created big monstrous books on these things, uh, just whole compilations of facts and everything else. 
in his course of wandering, he finally came on to this guy, Thomas Jefferson Mayfield. Thomas Jefferson Mayfield was a white man. He was born in Kentucky in 1843. His father was a soldier who fought in the War of 1812 and then fought with Sam Houston in the uh, Mexican-American War and the liberation of the conquest of Texas from Mexico. In 1850, the father brought his wife, Thomas Jefferson Mayfield, and two older brothers to the gold fields. They went off to Fremont's. They were heading off to Fremont's place in La, Marispo La, La Mariposas. And in 1850, they came around the Horn, and they landed at Yerba Buena. And they headed down from San Francisco. They headed down to San Jose. Then they went off to around toward Gilroy. Then they went up over the Pacheco Pass. And in, and I'll go through the story, and I'll read some of the passages, because they ultimately settled in the southern part of the valley. They settled up near the King's River, and um, the mother died over there. And the older brothers went off, and the father didn't know what to do with this Thomas Jefferson Mayfield. So the Indians who were around there adopted him. And he lived with them for a couple of years. And it's the only account that I've ever come across of a European who actually was able to, at that point in history, live with one of the native peoples in California who were still living their traditional life. Uh, all of the other accounts that we get from Europeans are accounts looking back a number of years. This is a man who absolutely lived during that time with them. And what I'll do is I'll read some of the passages as he talks about living with the Yokuts the Choinimni people of coming over. And then uh, after I read them, I'll uh, comment and start talking about some of these other things. He First of all, he talks about coming over the pass, uh, over at the Pacheco Pass. And he said, suddenly my daddy pointed over the tops of the bare hills ahead of us and exclaimed, Look there, and there in the distance, until then lost to us in the haze, was our valley. A shining thread of light marked El Rio de San Joaquin, flowing, as my mother said, through a crazy quilt of color. How excited we all were. Everyone wanted to talk at once. Then someone noticed, still farther to the east, that what we had at first taken for clouds was a high range of snow-covered peaks, their bases lost in the purple haze. Finally, we started on and passed down the long ridge, which my daddy called the hog's back, to the small valley below. There we found the grass we had seen from above to be wild oats. They stood as high as our stirrups and were as thick as they could grow. My daddy said that it was the finest country he had ever seen. So they then enter the valley, they enter the San Joaquin Valley. And, and then he says, by this time we could see what had caused the mass of color so noticeable from the mountain the day before. The entire plain, as far as we could see, was covered with wildflowers. Almost all of the flowers were new to us. And he then describes the various flowers, one flower after the other. And um, uh, as we passed below the hills, the whole plain was covered with great patches of rose, yellow, scarlet, orange, and blue. The colors did not seem to mix to any great extent. Each kind of flower liked a certain kind of soil best, and some of the patches of one color were a mile or more across. Uh, remember, that, I'm, I'm going to talk about that passage later, this whole business of patches, of not all of the species mixed together, but a patch of this flower and a patch of that flower. Um, I believe we were more excited out there on the plains among the wildflowers than we had been when we saw the valley for the first time from the mountain the day before. Several times we stopped to pick the different kinds of flowers, and soon we had our horses and packs decorated with masses of all colors. Uh, my daddy had traveled a great deal 
and it was not easy to get him excited about wildflowers or pretty scenery, but he said that he could not have believed that such a place existed if he had not seen it himself. And my mother cried with joy and wanted to make a home right there in the midst of it all. Well, he then describes uh, passing through areas where there were tremendous dens of ground squirrels. Uh, and that later on, when uh, the land fell into cultivation, that the uh, ground squirrels were eliminated or the ground squirrels, I don't know, the ground squirrels left. But he talks about these huge dens, these huge acres and acres and acres of ground squirrels. And um, the uh, badgers that were in there going after the ground squirrel holes. And then he says, I also remember glimpses of great droves of antelopes standing out against the horizon at a distance. When we neared the San Joaquin River, we saw about 20 elk. We had approached quite close to them, but had not seen them at once. And they were hurrying away through a low swale, a dry slough, which paralleled the river. I will always remember how quickly they disappeared and how clever they were at making use of the cover. There were a few oak trees near, and they kept these between us and themselves. They lowered their heads with their horns against their necks and shoulders and sneaked along as rapidly as a horse could run. <coughs> uh, we also saw some tracks along the river that my daddy said were made by bears. And he talks about grizzlies. And then he says, the most amusing sight I remember on the plains before we reached the San Joaquin River was a large flock of sandhill cranes. We passed within 40 yards of some of them, and they hardly noticed us. Quite a large group of them were holding a sort of powwow. They would all jabber a while, and then they would do a sort of fandango. We laughed at them for a long while. They were so sober and earnest about it. <laughs> So that they then go up to the Fremont Mines, and the father doesn't like it there at all. Uh, that it's already crowded. It's 1850, and it's already people staking out claims, and it's too noisy, and uh, it's not at all what he had hoped for. He was looking for the virgin frontier. So then they went off to the San Joaquin River, where the San Joaquin River heads west. It kind of goes down the valley, and then it heads upslope into the Sierra. So they kind of went over there. and. Um, the, uh, there's a, a wonderful scene where they come across a group of Indians bathing. And the Indians stop. And here's this uh, bunch of people coming with their saddle horses and everything else. And they're tremendously helpful to help them cross, including young Thomas Jefferson Mayfield, young Tom Mayfield there, is given uh, he um, goes across the river on the backs of one of the young women who swims him across the river. So they help them uh, bring their stuff across. Then as they settle there, they give them acorn bread and fresh meat. The Indians start bringing them food. Uh, they build a sluice up around where Fort Miller was later to be put. Build, and they start to gold mine up there. And all the time they're gold mining up there, they're talking about how the Indians brought them more meat and more acorn. And they were just kept bringing them this food. And um, after a little while, the river rose, and it knocked out their sluice box. So the father then picked up, and he moved off to the King's River. He kept going down south. So he goes now, he's now down further down south in the valley, and he goes off to the King's River. During the first three years we were on Sycamore Creek, the Indians furnished the meat of our food. At first, we used to hunt and fish a great deal, but we gradually quit it because they used to keep game hanging in the large oak tree in front of the house and also left their acorn bread at the back door. Most of the time, we would never see them do this as they would bring the things while we were gone or at night while we were asleep. We appreciated this a great deal, as it was a long, hard trip to Stockton after supplies, and we also had very little cash to spend. Of course, we were always good to the Indians and gave them green corn and wheat, but we never in any way came near repaying them for what they did for us. Then uh, he talks about how his mother dies, and he goes to live with the southern Yokuts uh, group, the Chonimne, uh, who live up along the King's River. And he talks about, and then comes these remarkable series of descriptions of what the village life was like, of what the houses were like. Now, up on the river, he describes the house that they had up there, which 
they would take a hole and they would dig a hole that would be two feet deep. And it might be 10 or 20 feet in diameter. Then, six inches apart, they would set up long uh, rods of willow. They would then bend the willow over on the top to make a kind of beehive. They would put a whole lot of tule, a whole lot of uh, bulrush reeds on. Then they would pack it with earth. And after a while, you would have grass growing up on the top. So these were like semi-subterranean houses that were built. And they were 10 or 20 feet as a good-sized house. Um, the um, house was used only in bad weather, except for sleeping. Otherwise, cooking and eating and all preparation of materials would be carried on outside. The floor of the house would be covered with several thicknesses of tule mats. So they took the tule and they made mats out of it. It wasn't just spread over, but it was like, um, like rattan or something like that. They had these nice clean mats that they would put over. Around the inside of the wall, tule mats would be piled up to a thickness of several inches. These served as mattresses for sleeping. When they could be obtained, grizzly bear skins were used on top of the mattresses. In very cold weather, a rabbit skin blanket would be used in addition to the bear skin. Then too in cold weather, some of the old people would be up most of the night rebuilding the fire. When I awakened, I would see them moving quietly about, sometimes talking to each other in low tones. So it's that kind of domestic scene that you have in there with the beds of Thule and the blankets and the older people at night coming over and rebuilding the fire. Then he talks about how outside the house there was a pit in which another fire would be built. And it was around that fire that people would sit all evening long, and uh, they would... Um, uh, dry themselves, and they would, uh, most of the time they would be outside. They didn't spend that much time inside. And then the Indians did not eat at regular hours, except possibly the evening meal. They had no electric lights, nor coal oil lamps, and they made it a practice to have all their work done, and their last eating done about sundown. The hunters would come in shortly before that time, and generally everyone would gather around for a meal. In the morning, after the dip in the river, the population of an Indian rancheria generally scattered. The men would visit all of their traps and snares to see what had been caught during the night. And they would have all out there. They'd have, he talks about how they put out their traps and their snares for the rabbits and the antelope and other animal. Even the small boys would have snares set. Some of the men would go hunting, some fishing, and some to work on things that they might be making. Some of the women would go into the hills after roots and other materials for weaving or basketry, or along the river to gather berries, or on the plains and hills to harvest seeds. Gradually, everyone would wander back to the ranch late in the afternoon. They would eat in turn as they wandered in. And then he talks about how this was not a hand-to-mouth existence. He talks about how the food was stored, how they had these granaries out there in which they were storing acorns, and how they had baskets of food and dried game and all of the rest. I mean, this was a, a plenty. These were people that had a plentiful life out there. Uh, he then uh, goes on as he's talking about the daily rhythm of things, the daily routine of things. He says, after the evening meal, they would all lay around the fire on the ground through the long evening and tell stories and sing as late as 10 or 11 o'clock. This was the finest part of their lives. Here was the real family circle. The long evenings were spent about the fires in the most pleasant way imaginable. Every night was a bonfire party. The old sages would tell stories about their own experiences when they were young, or about the history of their tribes, or just simple stories that they made up. We youngsters would sit around with our mouths and eyes and ears open and listen until we had to go to bed. Uh, and then he talks about the musical instruments that were played, the clapper and the floor drum, and they had a musical bow that was like a, a hunting bow. Um, and uh, as the evening wore on and various individuals grew tired or sleepy, they would wander off to bed. 
We would go inside and lie down on the mattresses next to the walls of the house with our feet to the fire and cover up with a rabbit skin blanket or whatever the weather demanded. We slept in the clothing we had been wearing during the day, which consisted of a breech cloth and a g-string. We had no shoes or other clothes to take off unless the weather was extremely cold when we might have a wild cat or mountain lion skin about our shoulders. He then talks about uh, the hunting of like ground squirrels. In a lot of the Central Valley, in much of California, people hunted, and up in the foothills, people hunted a lot of deer and uh, ate a lot of acorns. But as you get down into the Central Valley, there wasn't as much deer, there were antelopes. And what people lived a lot off of, he said, were the ground squirrels. That the squirrels, and he, and he talks about how they would go out and they would smoke them out of their uh, houses. They would uh, put in, um, fire and uh, smoke them out and then they would dig them out and a person might end up having like around his belt just all of these squirrel skins that would then be taken back to uh, feast on. Uh, and it says, uh, ground squirrels were almost the best and most unfailing of the food sources. And then he goes on to talk about how they would eat mud hens and ducks and geese, larks, sandhill cranes, swans, rabbits, raccoons, antelope, elk, deer, gophers, many kinds of roots and seeds, and other things of minor importance. They ate great quantities of young tule roots, which were soft and sweet, and they also ate roots of flags, which tasted like slippery elm. He then talks, I mean, this is the most incredible kind of, like, um, he's enough of an outsider so he can sum up these things from the outside, and yet he was enough of an insider so this guy seems to know what he's talking about. Um, he talks about the chief, and he talks about how the chief was, like, uh, responsible for the welfare of the tribe and had to settle all of the petty quarrels and differences, and yet he says people quarreled very little. Uh, they almost never quarreled or argued with one another, and uh, in general, they did very little useless talking. They were not as speechless as many people suppose, but they were not inclined to talk or gossip carelessly. Uh, I remember one hair pulling between two of the women and one or two quarrels between the men. Um, about the method of selecting a chief, I am not sure, as I was not with them long enough to take any part in the tribal deliberations. But I am sure that if the chief had been lax in the performance of his duties, someone else would have been selected in his stead. I do not mean that the tribe would have voted him out, but they would simply have looked to someone else for advice and help and he would have automatically been out of his position in the tribe. And that is indeed the way it would work, that um, it was not, uh, you didn't have these kind of autocratic rulers that uh, had tremendous power. It was more somebody that was respected and somebody that um, uh, was, uh, people went to, and it was a natural kind of leader. Often ran in families, often uh, particular families had leadership families, but it um, was not this strong ruler. It was not this uh, person that gave commands and orders. Uh, it was much more subtle. It was much more work through family lines. The, uh, then comes this incredible description. Uh, and I had heard about this, you know, I had heard about this, but gee, the, the, the description was absolutely thrilling. That he talks about the annual trip that they make to Tulare Lake. Now, as uh, people probably know, Tulare Lake is down there. It's at the, uh, it's kind of a terminal lake where uh, Kings River comes down and the Kowea River comes down. And I believe that uh, the Kern also flows into it in the very southern part of the valley. And it um, flows in and it creates, or it used to create, uh, this tremendous lake that was the largest lake, I believe, in the west outside of the Great Salt Lake. And um, it very rarely, it was kind of, as you come down the valley, there's a kind of hump in there. And only in the rainiest of seasons would it rise up above that hump and drain into the San Joaquin, as I understand it. Uh, and it was enough, it would happen every so often so that the lake never got salty the way terminal lakes often do. It kept it fresh and clean. But on the other hand, you just had this tremendous lake and it would broaden out in the uh, spring and in the early summer and then it would kind of shrink in upon itself and it would broaden out and it was covered with tulies. So all of the people on the, on, along these rivers, 
along the King River, they would make these boats, these tule boats. And these boats would be, so he, he talks about them as cigar shaped. They were 50 feet long. Right? And that, I mean, 50 feet is a long, long boat. And this whole village gets into uh, these three gigantic boats. And they begin to pull down the river toward the lake for their uh, springtime excursion. And um, they have uh, their um, dunnage, their um, supplies, and their camp equipment, their mortars, their pestles, baskets of acorns, acorn bread, seeds, meat, skins for bedding, and many other things. On the side of the boat sat eight or ten Indians, generally one or two families. For we children, this trip was an occasion of great excitement. Uh, the trip was made in the late spring when the flood from the melting snows in the mountains provided enough water in the river to float the raft over the sandbars. Uh, he then talks about going. Every day they would go two or three miles. And very often the men would pull it, but some of the men would be on the shore doing the hunting. And then they would prepare a campground, and the boats would pull in, and they would camp at night. Uh, and then three or four of the men stood at the sides of the raft and kept it away from the snags in the main current. In this way, we floated along at about two or three miles an hour. Uh, at night, the raft was moored to the bank in a quiet place, and we camped on shore. It was really one of the greatest experiences I have ever had, and certainly the greatest I had while living with the Indians. I believe that they, too, enjoyed these trips more than any other of their experiences. We traveled in style and in comfort. The river was lined with trees and vines, and it was one beautiful scene after another. Um, and he talks about the, how slowly they traveled, just kind of hunting along the way. Occasionally, we met or saw Indians from other tribes along the river. They were all friendly and seemed to take our trip as a matter of course. I remember that once a party of three of these Indians rode with us for a day. They then come down to Tulair Lake. <laughs> and uh, in Tulare Lake, they find the Tachi were living there, another Yokuts group. And there they find a whole other style of house. The Tachi made their houses by, he's got this lovely description of them, but I don't think it'll read too well. Um, they would take two poles, two uh, sticks that were forked at the top. And you place one down here, and you place one over there, and you run a beam across them. And then you kind of draw around it a huge oval. You take and you put willows around that oval, and you bank them up to the top and leave an entrance. So you have this long oval house. Some of these houses were made with multiple poles, and some of them were 100 feet long. You had multiple families living in them. And there was, uh, in these wonderful descriptions, it's not here, but there are these wonderful descriptions of standing at one end at night. And you see the compartments, the, like apartments in which people lived. And you could see the fires as you looked down. You could see all of the people that were living in these apartments. And you had these long, long houses. The outside of it was made of uh, tule. But it wasn't just thrown on. They made mats. And the mats were very detailed and exquisitely made. They were shaped. They were squarish mats on the side. And then as you get around to the ends that were curved, the mats were kind of shaped out like a fan so that they would come out. And you'd have inner mats and outer mats so that the outer mat would catch the water, the rain, if it rained, and it would stop it. And then it, it, it would kind of just trickle down, and whatever went off would kind of come off in the inner mat. And the inside was built up because the ground was really wet around to their legs. You didn't dig it in like other people did. It was kind of built up a little bit. And so he sees these houses that are over there. And then they begin uh, this. Uh, and once again, I'd heard about this stuff. And uh, God, it was just the most wonderful description. They begin building the rafts that they would make for the Tulare Lake. And these rafts would end up being like some, some of them were 70 or 80 feet long. And they would build them out of willow withes and run tule through them. And you'd have these huge, huge rafts. And on the rafts, they would take, and in one place, they would put 
uh, a hearth. They would pack earth and they would make a hearth and they would put firewood on it. And they would end up, families would go on, they'd bring all of their baskets and everything and they would just pull around in the lake to all of its sloughs and all of its little uh, places on this raft. And they had various ways in which they would catch fish, in which they would catch geese, in which they would catch duck, uh, that were just tremendously plentiful in the uh, lake at that time. Uh, and then eventually the uh, lake would shrink and it would be time to go on to summer things and they would then head back up in their tule boats, they would head back up, uh, pull back up the river and eventually go back to their place. Just a wondrous description. Um, then comes the, um, uh, these tremendously painful descriptions of uh, things uh, falling apart. Uh, I made two trips to Tulare Lake with the Indians. If my memory is accurate, they were made in the summers of 1852 and 1853. I do not believe that my tribe made any such excursions later than 1853, as the reservation had broken up their routine. They had been deprived of their game and were rapidly starved and crowded into the hills in competition with their hostile mountain neighbors. Uh, I never saw one of the large Thule rafts after the second trip. So by 1853, I mean, it was just this little window in which you saw this before the reservations were created, before people were thrown in with their hereditary enemies from the hills and between, and, and that horrible word starvation in what was really this land of incredible plenty as people were kept from their old uh, grounds. Then comes, um, um, and I, I won't get into it too much, except that everybody ought to know it. I mean, there, there was just periods of slaughter. There were periods of um, just absolutely the most hideous treatment that one race of humans can give another race of humans. And um, uh, the um, and, and there was and it has this dreadful story of a white man named Man, M-A-N-N, -N, who married an Indian woman. And these vigilantes were coming around rounding up Indians for the reservation. And they came in and they tried try to drag his wife out because she was Indian. And he tried to defend her and he was killed and she was dragged off to the reservation. And um, uh, he says, I expect that this story about the killing of man sounds pretty bad. And probably a number of other things I am telling about the Indians and the white people may give the impression that I favor the Indians and am prejudiced against the white people. In the first place, I have never talked about my life with the Indians because I had very little to tell that the white people liked to hear. I knew the Indians in their natural state and I know that they were the finest people that I have ever met. I am not telling what I would like to be able to tell, only what I heard and saw. There is no use trying to deny that the Indians I knew were for the most part naked savages, but I have found that in the 67 or more years since I have left them, that just wearing a lot of clothes does not make people decent. Neither does going around naked necessarily make people indecent. He then uh, goes off, uh, when the Indians got dragged off to reservations and stuff, he goes off to school and he says, I uh, and this is the last passage that I'll read, uh, when I started to school, I believe that my speech must have been a little peculiar from my having talked so much Indian. It may have been that I unconsciously used a few Indian words. At least the boys at school used to make fun of me. I had to whip every boy in school before they would let me alone about it. Then too, there seemed at this time in the minds of many white people to be some sort of stigma attached to my life with the Indians. Whether they thought I was some sort of squaw man or half-breed, I do not know. I had considerable trouble over this while I was around Vesalia and had to whip several people because of it. From then on, I resolved to never speak of my life with the Indians. People in general had so many wrong notions about Indians and were so ignorant about their life that I was continually drawn into arguments about them. Everyone was so sure they knew all about Indians that I'd made up my mind I would never tell them any different. Since I left Vesalia in 1862, I do not believe that I have talked about Indians more than an hour altogether except to and then he, the, the Mitchell family, and then he thanks the Mitchell family. And it's, um, I guess, in this way that this extraordinary history gets buried by the, um, this complete 
refusal to speak because all that it ended up doing was getting him into fights about people who certainly knew much more about Indians than he did. Um, let me make a couple, of more, a couple of comments about the early life. Was that a wonderful description? Yeah, it was just a wonderful description. I'm, gonna, I, I've got, um, uh, I'm trying to get hold of, if anybody knows Frank Lotta's heirs, uh, I think his daughter, Donna Olson, uh, is still around. I would love to get the rights to reprint this uh, description. I mean, this is um, uh, one of the most complete views of that old way of life that I've ever seen. Well, let me talk a little bit about a couple of uh, random things that uh, I would like to talk about. One of them is, let's just talk about those houses for a while. Uh, now, the early settlers really made fun of the Indians for having Thule houses. And there's something in the Western viewpoint that at this time, I think Europe was just going through a place where they were getting rid of thatched houses. At one time, a lot of Europeans also lived in thatched houses. And we still have that great story of the three little piggies who, um, the one that lived in the straw house just got knocked out, and then the one that lived in the wooden house didn't last too long. But it was a good thing to live in a good, strong house of brick and stone and stuff like that. And Europeans have this tremendous value for big houses. They really love these kinds of, uh, this, this is the mark of a good life, is to have a kind of large house. And they would look at these straw houses, and of course they called them huts and uh, dismiss them. The, um, uh, there were many different kinds of houses. I mean, there were many different kinds of Indian people. The Yokuts, the Mono who lived up in the hills, the Miwok who lived up into the hills and around through the plains. Uh, people that spoke different languages. There were uh, several different Miwok languages up in the hills. There were, I believe, 22 different dialects of the Yokuts language. Uh, there were everywhere you went, people had adapted ways of life that fit the place that they were living and the materials that they were living. As you get up toward this area, as you get up toward the uh, foothills, as you get up into it where the Miwok people live, the Sierra Miwok, you then had like big roundhouses that were built, these big underground roundhouses that are still around. And uh, these were not, like the ones along the Kern River seemed to be individual family dwellings. They were large and maybe several families lived there. Once you get up into this area, you have these round assembly houses or uh, religious houses or cultural centers or, they, you know, they were probably like universities. I mean, they'll still talk about, they'll still talk about, some of the old timers will still talk about how they used to in the old days dance at the Ione Roundhouse or something like that. And they'll talk about the, elders that lived there, almost like a faculty, like they, st they learned to dance and sing from old Pedro himself or something like that. And these were centers of learning. These were centers of culture. These were places where people were initiated. These were places where songs were passed on. These were places where um, ceremonies were held for days on end. And the houses varied. The people varied from one place to another. But these old Thule houses, um, now, What it meant to live in one of those houses meant that it was, first of all, in this culture we have, or we value, not all of us have, but we value large houses that are well lit, that have a lot of rooms, that have a lot of independent space. We pay dearly for that. A tremendous amount of our time gets spent, a huge amount of our time gets spent maintaining and earning the money for that kind of thing. This is not free these houses. Uh, and this is our value. I mean, we'll end up spending a third of our salary. We'll end up spending a tremendous amount of time fixing things and repairing things. And at the end, you know, this is for most people that own their own home. This is the best thing that they have. Uh, the Indians didn't have that value of that sort of thing. They had a lot more time than we have. They also had, and that time was often religious time. That time was spent in dance, it was spent singing, it was spent in uh, a variety of activities. The um, other thing about it is that the materials always came from right around there. There was no big transportation system. And everybody had the capacity to build a house, especially the Thule houses. You didn't have this tremendous class difference that we have, where some people have 
huge and magnificent houses, and some people live in little apartments. And nowadays, there are some people that are pushing shopping carts down the street that don't have any house whatsoever. Everybody had a house. Everybody had the power to build a house. It was fundamentally an egalitarian society. It was fundamentally a society in which the differences between, and there were class differences. There were definitely good families and not so good families. But the differences, and, and, and very often Indian people make a big deal out of being this, you know, from a much more proper family than somebody else. Uh, so it wasn't as if it was a completely uh, homogenous society. It wasn't. There were definitely class differences. But they were relatively small compared to the society that we have constructed, that people had an independence, people had an ability to take care of themselves that I think for the most part that we've lost. And it's only when you get into societies that put in a whole lot of effort into houses that you then get into much greater hierarchies and much greater kinds of uh, things. And it was um, very much, I mean, you, you, you'll come out to those older societies and you find that everybody has the strength of being able to have and live in and own and construct their own home. And it's a wonderful thing, you know, I think in the old days you would come out, you come into a human habitation right now, you'll see them, by, you'll see them from the side of the freeway and they stand out. They just look like they've been planted from somewhere else. You have a square house over there. In those old days, you would come along and the village was made of exactly the same thing as the land around it. It had the same colors as the land around it. It was part of the land around it. It fit in there. It was not all that different. It was not all that standing out sort of thing. It was... Um, uh, a part of the landscape, it had the same color, it was decaying the same way that the landscape came, decayed. The um, other thing that uh, I would love to talk about is uh, I keep trying to figure out what the population of the Central Valley is. And uh, the fact of the matter is I don't know because uh, there's uh, no way of really finding out what it was in the old days. There was a, a terrible cholera epidemic that uh, Hudson Bay people brought through in the, uh, malaria maybe, in 1833 that wiped out tremendous numbers of people. So nobody really knows, and there were various ways that people tried to estimate what the population was. The smallest number that I've seen for the Yokuts people is around 11,000. Uh, and the highest number that I've seen is somewhere around 50,000. Now, let's take a look at what that, let, let's assume that it's a high number. Let's assume that there were 50,000 or even more. On one hand, this was, along the rivers, there were like, people estimate there were 10 people per square mile, which was, for North American populations, the densest population that you would get outside of the big population centers of Mexico City. I mean, this was, 10 people per square mile was a tremendously dense population. On the other hand, 50,000 people, um, I believe that the Oakland, that big stadium in Oakland holds about 50,000 people or so. Uh, that um, we're talking about uh, like one, that it, it, I, th I think it holds about 50,000. Uh, we're talking about like one big gigantic football stadium and spreading these people out over that whole Central Valley. I mean, we're talking about, and they, they're clustered, they're in groups of people. And when the Spaniards came through, they kept talking about how well populated it was. But they're using a different standard of comparison. By our standards of comparison, there were not that many people around. And yet, even though there weren't that many people around, there was this tremendous wildlife presence that all of the early people talk about. Um, Mayfield didn't get into those grand descriptions of what the geese and the ducks were like that were flying through uh, during the fall migrations, where there were descriptions of how they would come into the Central Valley and just darken the sky with their numbers. And they would come through day after day after day, the geese and the ducks just flying through and settling into the marsh. There are tremendous descriptions of the king salmon that would come in through the, through the uh, San Francisco Bay and come up through the delta. And when they were passing by the Raccoon Straits, which is up the Carquina Strait, I'm sorry, Carquina Straits, up um, uh, where it narrows down, 
And before they would head out into the delta to come down the San Joaquin River, the common description was that it looked like you could walk across the straits on the backs of the salmon as they were coming through. And you'd have this mass of fish just coming through and populating here. And you'd have the various, the eagles and the condors and all of these other birds that were here and the great, the great herds of antelope. Uh, and there was this really strong wildlife presence. And Mayfield gets into it in his descriptions a little bit. But the distance between people and animals wasn't as great as it is today. Uh, men would go out. He talks about this. He has a great description of how the men would put on uh, deer heads with antlers and how they would go out among the herds of deer. They would uh, sweat themselves. They would cover themselves with herbs. They would disguise themselves as deer. And they would go out among the herds of deer. And they would get within 10 feet or so of the deer before they would shoot. They would spend hours moving in among the deer. There are descriptions. I think it was Estudillo, when he first came into the uh, San Joaquin Valley, he talked about how when he came to the villages, there were gallinas, he calls them, chickens. And of course, there were no chickens here. There must have been some, it must have been quail that were just kind of hanging around the village, eating the scraps and stuff like that. There are descriptions of how the coyotes, the, the, the trickster, this character that was always in the myths, would come running into people's houses and steal some meat and run out again. Uh, that the distance between people, when, when Europeans came with rifles and in great numbers, that distance widened right away. But back when people were hunting with bows and arrows, and back when people were not that great an impact, when they just didn't go out and kill things at random because they were there, that distance between people and animals was very, very uh, close. And people lived in a world in which everything felt alive. You get still, you talk to some of the uh, more traditional people and you still get that sense of living in a world, you know, like we have things like roadways and cars. I mean, this car just kind of sits there and it's sort of dead. And then you start it up and it moves. But it, it does what you want it to do most of the time. You kind of step on the gas, it moves forward. Step on the brake, it stops. The world was filled with independent entities that lived and breathed. And they were animals and they were plants. And you the house was made of a tule that was kind of decaying, and you'd put it on. And the earth was shaking with earthquakes. And there was the moon, and there was the sun. And there were no straight lines anywhere. There was nothing mechanical anywhere. There was a living world that people lived in. And they were not the dominant characters in this world. They were grizzly bears. They were mountain lions. They were eagles. They were all these tremendously powerful, grand animals that were around in there. And people lived in a kind of, as part of, that world that was tremendously alive. And you still feel it. You still feel that uh, sense of how they, um, that feeling. And it's the most wonderful feeling. It's a feeling that things around us are alive in the same way that we're alive. Uh, there's this great story, a yogurt story uh, that I had heard about a guy who went out to hunt bears. And the re the, he decided that the way he would hunt bears was that he would build a platform up in a tree. And he would get a whole lot of acorns up on that platform. And he would go there at dawn, and he would throw the acorns off the platform and let them hit the ground one at a time. And the sound of the acorns hitting the ground would attract the bear. And then when the bear came to eat the acorns, he would stab the bear. He had a, he had a spear up there, and he would kind of uh, kill the bear. So he builds the platform. He gets this cache of acorns up there. And uh, he finishes his work, and then he leaves. He comes back at dawn to get up to the tree, to go up into the platform. And as he approaches the platform, he hears <coughs> plink, <laughs> plink, <laughs> plink, <laughs> plink. So he comes over there, and he looks up. And he sees that there's a bear up there on the platform. And the bear is kind of looking there, and the bear is kind of flicking the acorns off one at a time. Well, the guy thinks that this is the funniest thing that he ever saw. I mean, he thinks this is really funny. But the part about this story that I just love is he also feels that the bear thinks it's funny. Isn't that great? That, that, that great? Yeah, that people and bears think the same way that we have, we share a joke. That bear is playing a trick on him because 
it's joking with him. And that sense, you know, that bears in people, that the things of this world, that the uh, plants of the world are all a kind of people that at work, they work in many ways the same way that we work. It's a marvelous perception. And it's a perception that this culture has tried to get rid of us. I mean, we, we're not supposed to be anthropomorphic. We're not supposed to think about the things around us as people or anything like that. And yet, boy, I mean, the, 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 one of the things we know is ourself. And uh, one of the things we know is ourself. And uh, if you don't use that knowledge in understanding the world, if you make this pretense that the things in the world are different, then it leads to some kind of a strangest alienation. It, it leads to something that is just absolutely much worse than anthropomorphic thinking. Terrible. The, um, and there was another kind of egalitarianism. There was another type of sense that animals had their integrity. Animals had their intelligence. Animals were a kind of people. And animals and people lived in the world. And they lived in the world by a sense of compact and reciprocity. That you lived in the world with, um, like, like we have, look, they, 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 they lived in the world with this sense that everything had its duty. It was like members of a family or something like that. Everything had its duty. And um, that I, uh, the animals gave themselves over to people. Uh, deer gave themselves over to be hunted. Acorns grew. Quail came. Salmon came up river. All of these things had their part. They were doing these things for people. And people had certain obligations within that world. And people had a certain duty within that world. It wasn't that people were these great conquerors that were going out and taking things. You still get that. You, know, you, you get it among uh, Indians today. You get it among basket weavers very often, where uh, there is the most marvelous sense that they are working. They're not, it's not this conquest over some inanimate, stubborn material. But it's more like going out and getting that material and helping that material, working with that material to actualize itself, to realize its own beauty. Uh, that you work in a way as in a partnership with the material around. That that material wants to give itself over to you. It wants to be used well. That material wants to be made into a beautiful basket. And you have with all, and, and there are certain ways in which you have to treat everything around you. And there are certain rules. Uh, the um, one of the big rules were uh, moderation. You didn't take more than you wanted. You treat you treated things with respect. You uh, treated the things around you uh, well. You said the right formulas. You said the right prayers. There were also other acts that had to be done. Uh, one of the things that Indian people did throughout all of California that we're just beginning to realize, people are just beginning to realize, was so tremendously important was the burning of the land. And, uh, and, and then they were continually out there burning land. And when California became a state, if you go into the county laws, almost the first law that every county has is a law that forbids the burning of wild land. And it was specifically aimed at Indians. And they said the Indians were addicted to burning the land. And throughout the state, they burned the land. And they did it for a very particular reason. They burned the land because it cleared it of brush. It cleared it of understory. It brought to bear certain kinds of seeds of certain kinds of plants that were good. It created a good game habitat. If you don't burn the land, then it, 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 it was good for basketry materials, such as, I think, bear grass and various other kinds of material that was used. And it was a cultural practice. Those old descriptions of people coming through these areas and finding cleared understory and big, bold oak trees, that was not necessarily a natural environment. That was an environment that was created by years of burning. The other thing that they did was, um, and they, it used to be there was a, um, an, an elderly Pomo woman named Mabel McKay. Uh, and she used to talk about how if, even if you don't want a plant, then you should still, every year, go out and gather some of it as so that the plant will know you're there. And I thought that that was, of course, a beautiful poetic statement. I thought that that was just a wonderful spiritual statement. Only recently have I come to realize that it was also a wonderful biological statement, even in the terms of hard biology, that people would go out 
and they would dig plants in certain ways that made those plants reproduce. There's somebody right now that's digging Indian potatoes, the Brodea bulb. And what she's finding is that if you dig them the way that the Indians say you're supposed to dig them at the right time of year, you take your digging stick, you dig them up, you pull them out, you strip off the little bulblets, you then throw them into your back. If you come back the next year, there are more Brodeas. If you come back the next year, there are more Brodeas. I have a strong feeling that Mayfield's description of the early San Joaquin Valley, where there were big patches of this colored flower and that colored flower and that colored flower, was because the people were out there and they were collecting those flowers, they were digging them up, they were doing various things. I think that in certain ways, a large part of that was a cultivated landscape. And you could see that still, because you don't have that now. If you, and, 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 and if you go back and collect those plants the way you're supposed to, the way the old timers tell you you're supposed to, then you increase. It's something that this culture doesn't understand, that by collecting stuff, you increase the fertility of the land. You collect it in such a way that it makes the land healthy, that the plant wants to be collected because that's good for the plant and it's good for the land. The, um, you still can go up to places where there are a lot of basket weavers, and you find that they're always trimming the willows, the red buds the hazelnuts, they're bringing them down to these nubs so that the next year they send up these shoots, these straight shoots that are good for basketry. Uh, you would go alongst these rivers that would be around here. It would almost be like plantations of basketry plants. And I say this because it's, um, you know, there's a kind of sense that Europeans had that when they came into California, they found this virgin wilderness and that you had this group of Indians that were just kind of living off the, ex the excess of it all. I don't think that's quite true. I don't think that's quite true. I think that in many ways this was a cultivated landscape and it bore the impression of people that had lived here and lived here well for thousands of years. Uh, it wasn't exactly like the farmlands of Iowa, but on the other hand, it was not virgin wilderness. And I... Um, point this out, I'll, I'll wind this down. Uh, I just looked at my watch. Um, that there's a tendency to speak about these things in the past tense, but of course it is not past tense. And I really want to emphasize the um, fact that uh, much of California was a tended landscape, because very often Indian people have the most incredible amount of trouble getting the plants that they need for basketry, for medicines, and from various other things. Because when people either, they'll manage a plot of land as farmland, or they'll manage a plot of land um, uh, as wilderness, in which nobody can touch anything. And yet you'll take a look at the Nature Conservancy's Kuiya Oaks thing. There have been Yokut's people that have been collecting basketry material off that thing for years and years and years, and that's why that basketry material grows the way it does. It's now off limits because of conservation facts, and people can no longer collect. So the Indians are watching. They'll kind of look over the fence, and they'll watch the way it's become brushed in and the way all of those plants are going in. And you know, it's an arguable thing about managing a place for wilderness by keeping hands off. I mean, maybe there are too many people around and uh, you have to keep hands off. And yet, on the other hand, that was never a wilderness. That was a human landscape. People had been using that landscape for thousands of years and, um, uh, and, and knew how to use it and know how to use it well. The, um, when I first started to get into uh, this sort of thing, um, as an outsider, clearly, uh, I was struck, and I still am, by the tragedy of how much has been lost and uh, the painful way in which things were lost. Uh, what I've learned recently is, of course, how much is still here. And I think that there's something that when we talk about the heritage of the Central Valley, the heritage of the Central Valley is not just in the preservation of the um, memory of things, the land of things. It also ought to be in a kind of cultural preservation of the people that still are here. There are people who still speak 
Tachi language. There are still people who still speak the Wakchumni language. There are still people who speak the Miwok language. There are still people who speak the Mono language. There are still people who speak the uh, Chukchansi language. There are still people who speak the languages around here. There are people who have the understanding of what this place is like. There are people who still want to collect the plants that were here. And there are people who still have a sense of the sacred land that's around here, of the places that they developed the relationship for years and years and years that those places are still there. And I think that that really is uh, a tremendously important part of the heritage of this. And I think to sort of draw a line and say that this is all past tense and that we live in these degenerate times and to give up is something that is really a tremendously, it's, it's just a, a, a dreadful thing and it uh, shouldn't happen. Uh, the um, uh, before questions, I'll just take a couple, just a couple of announcements. One of them is that um, I've been part of um, a kind of an outsider. There's a group that's formed for language preservation. And uh, they're having a master apprenticeship program where, uh, for, for example, there's a Wukchumni woman from the Tule River Reservation who is going to be paid for about four months to live with a younger Wukchumni man so that they can speak only the Wukchumni language. And you end up having, I mean, it's just absolutely vital to preserve these languages into the next generation and to preserve these kinds of programs. And if there's anybody around here, to be blunt about it, that has any money to support these master apprentice things. Uh, I mean, this is the real library, is what's in people's minds and what's in people's hearts and what's in a living language. So if anybody does, I'll tell you who in the world you can contribute it to, and it would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, the other uh, thing that I would uh, like to mention uh, is uh, that um, you know, there are many things that go on, and people that want to uh, meet uh, some Indians and know what's going on and take and dip into this tremendous font of uh, beauty and wisdom and uh, people, one of the best things you can do is there's a basket weavers gathering. Uh, does somebody want to make an announcement on that basket weavers gathering, Jennifer? Oh, you want me to do it? Okay. Uh, there's a basket weavers gathering on um, Tuolumne Rancheria, which is a, a small Indian reservation up in the hills. It's on uh, June 27th through 29th. The, uh, it's the third of a basket weavers gathering, and the first two were absolutely epic. It was um, people from all over the state. Uh, and uh, people that have preserved the traditions, the skills of basketry. And along with those traditions and skills comes a whole body of attitudes, a whole understanding, and a whole piece of wisdom. So anybody that can get up to Tuolumne Rancheria on uh, June 27th and through 29th should do so. And once again, if you want some more information about that, then at the reception, uh, there'll be a couple of people there that are part of that group. So thank you. Uh, do people have questions, or is somebody going to bring a question up? How's, how's this, how's this going to work? I'd like to invite you to come up and uh, ask a question. Therefore, I will pick up the cards and I'll do the question. <coughs> Which of Frank Lotte's books contains the Tom Jefferson Mayfield writings? Uh -huh. uh, the um they originally appeared in a book that's uh, all of his books, as near as I can tell. I just I just checked today with books in print, and I believe every single one of his books is out of print. Uh, it originally appeared in a book 19, in 1929, and it was called Uncle Jeff's Stories. Uh, and then the subtitle was San Joaquin Primeval. He wrote another book that was uh, his daughter published it, I believe, in 1978. And it had a, gee, what was the title of it? Something like Tail Hook Tales? Does anybody know? Yeah, I think it was something like Tail Hook Tales. And he includes that within that uh, book. The, um, uh, 
Well, I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that ought to be in every home. That, that Mayfield book ought to be in every home in the Central Valley. Can you name the Mitchell to whom Mayfield the story of uh, that is that, um, you know, this guy, uh, Mayfield, was silent. I mean, he refused to talk about, he had been so uh, traumatized by this whole thing that he refused to talk about anything having to do with Indians because he'd just get into fights. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until 1928, when the guy was virtually on his deathbed, that Frank Latta staggered in and uh, found him by complete accident. He just kind of met him, in a, he met somebody in a parking lot that said, have you um, ever heard of this guy, um, Mayfield? And Mayfield had told his story to the uh, Mitchells and um, uh, Mike Mitchell. And that's all I know about Mike Mitchell. I believe that he lived in Visalia. All right. How do we subscribe to news from native California? <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. No, that's a great question. Uh, the uh, <laughs> uh, you can either uh, there are some there should be some copies of it out there that have a subscription form in them, or uh, you can give me a name and address, and we'll send you the latest issue with a bill. <laughs> <laughs> And it's, uh, I think, 1750 a year. How did someone who was born in the East become so interested in the history of the San Joaquin Valley? Because he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it, um, I've often wondered that. And, um, uh, believe me, my relatives back there often wonder that. <laughs> and, I, um, and I think it was probably accident. I think that um, I came out, uh, you know, I'd lived as a writer for a long time and lived in uh, interesting places that writers live in, uh, the Caribbean and New York and places like that. And then uh, I came out with my wife in 68 uh, because you couldn't have kids in New York, although some people seem to do it. I just couldn't figure out how you, what you did with them. Uh, so we came uh, to California, and um, I just began writing about stuff, and I began writing about natural history for some reason. And when I first moved here, I just didn't even know there were any Indians around. And I wrote uh, books of, a couple of books of natural history. And then I wrote a book. I decided to do some research on what the Indians who lived a long time ago, how they used plants. And um, uh, so I thought it was going to be a piece of library research. And um, I was shocked as I got into it. And um, first of all, found out that it was just Indian life was tremendously complicated. And sometimes it makes Western life. And we have this image that Indian life was very simple and our life is very complicated. In certain spheres, Indian life is just tremendously complicated. And I realized that I had a tremendous amount to learn. And it's kind of, you know, as a writer, you get into stuff. And you just, um, uh, and, and I couldn't quite, you know, I'd already started to do the research, and I already started to do the writing. And, um, and there was a brief period of time in which it actually almost took me over. Uh, I, I was very lousy company for a while. And, um, you know, I'd just write something, and uh, I'd realized that it was all wrong. And uh, I just have to work at it again and again and again and ask people questions. And then I began to meet through that writing. I began to meet Indian people. And I began to make trips out to places like the San Joaquin Valley and elsewhere. And um, I, for some reason that uh, I only dimly understand, um, <coughs> It may be selfish. It may very well be that as a writer and as a publisher, you need great material. And you need material that has beauty to it. And you need material that has a purpose to it. And it brings out the best in the writer. And it brings out the best in the publisher. Uh, and I just have found myself into this sort of thing. I feel I have something to offer. And I um, uh, feel I have something to say. And um, I guess the answer is I'm puzzled by it myself. <laughs> All right. Assuming that there has been uh, no, no or additional interference and there was proliferation, there are Indian societies still be egalitarian. I'm sorry, say, say, can you say that again, please? 
um, assuming no or little interference and proliferation, would our Indian society still be egalitarian? Gee, I suppose by proliferation, it, uh, it, it's meant what happens if the population increased greatly. Is that, that, that's what I assume it means. It, if if uh, the Europeans had never come, but can you maintain an egalitarian uh, society in a place where there are lots of people? Um, I think the term egalitarian is uh, a relative term. I don't think people are equal. I don't think societies have complete equality. I think that um, uh, what I was trying to say is that uh, the uh, Yokut's, traditional Yokut society was in many ways more egalitarian than our own. And I think it's an irony that this society as a democracy prides itself in its egalitarianism. But I think that there is a true egalitarianism that was out there, or at least was much closer. Um, the uh, matter of population, um, you know, the population was fairly limited, that people were able to control their numbers. So you never did get, and, and, and it was controlling its numbers by a bunch of uh, customs and habits and uh, rules and an understanding that uh, you couldn't have too many people. And it was a very, very complicated thing that was worked deeply into the culture. Uh, so you never did have like huge numbers of people and these big, these territorial conquests. You never had territorial conquest in California. You had fighting, you had people making war on each other, but you never had the people from here marching over to for Lebensraum to take over somebody else's territory. Uh, I think that if the populations had for some reason or other increased, then we would be talking about a different kind of people than the people we're talking about. I think, we'd, I think you just can't increase the population without also having changed a whole lot of other things that were around. So it's not as if you know, there was this one variable, you change the population and then what happens to egalitarianism? I think that the, um, uh, the whole society, we'd, we'd, we'd be talking about a different people. Uh, so I, I, I don't know that it could. You know, that, Difficult question. Good question. You mentioned that there were conflicts between people that were, quote, eight-year-old enemies, unquote. How were these conflicts resolved? As far as I can see, they're still not resolved. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, they're not resolved, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, there are people who really hate each other out there, uh, and they've hated each other for centuries. Um, but, um, what you never did have were big institutions of war, uh, that people didn't have very much special war equipment. They didn't have this value that to be a real man, you had to go off and fight somebody or kill somebody or count coup on somebody or something like that. War was just kind of, I mean, nobody really liked it uh, too much. It was just something you had to do, and it was uh, something you really didn't like to do very much, even though you were often fighting. And there were all kinds of uh, ways of limiting war, so that, um, but it was complicated. Even the people that were enemies, that hated each other, very often in these small societies, one of the big shortages was marriage partners. So if you're living in a small group of people that number only a few hundred, and if you've got all of these rules that they did about who you could marry and who you couldn't marry, what clan they were, what, uh, part of the village they lived in, how closely you were to be related, then very often you would get people that wouldn't have a marriage partner from around the immediate neighborhood, and you'd end up having to marry out from one of these other tribes that were around you. So uh, people were, even as they were enemies, they were also at the same time very often related and interrelated, and they had old, they, they had the ability to go and gather stuff on somebody else's land, and it was much more porous than it is. We have this idea of enmity as a kind of, once again, we have this territorial sense that there's a group that lives here, and then there's a group that lives here, and that they're enemies. And that's not the way it was. That uh, there was uneasiness, there was friction, you didn't like the way they spoke, you didn't like the way they did things, they were stingy, they were greedy, they were practicing all sorts of evil tricks and stuff like that. There was uneasiness, there was tension, uh, you would fight with them, you didn't like them, your kids didn't like them. 
Uh, it kind of went on and on. But it wasn't the way we think of enemies. It was, I mean, we use this word enemies as if we know it. You know, it, there should be another word for it. Uh, I don't know what that other word, I don't know what the Indian words are for it. But it's not like European enmities where you had these incredible territorial conquests and dogmatic conquests. You were just, you know, 100,000 people being killed because they didn't believe in the Trinity or something like that. I mean, you just never had anything like that. that was, they didn't have enemies like that. <laughs> well, did the Central Valley Indians use the natural drugs like peyote in their religious ceremonies? What about rock mushrooms? Uh, the one that they, 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 as far as I know, they had two drugs. Um, I don't know. I don't know that peyote grows around here. Um, I don't think it does. Uh, they had two drugs that they used. Uh, the one that they used on a fairly regular basis was tobacco, uh, and um, the native tobaccos, the native Nicotianas, are apparently much stronger than the. Uh, domestic varieties. And these were used uh, in a variety of ways. And they were used, um, uh, they weren't smoked red. You didn't just sit there and smoke them uh, all day long. You had a bunch of Indians sitting there with uh, cigarettes hanging out of their mouths in the old days. And you didn't, you didn't, you didn't quite have that. Uh, but it would be used, you'd have a kind of couple of puffs. And it would uh, put you in a slightly altered state of consciousness. And it was also used for certain kinds of religious things. You'd swallow some of it uh, and all that. The major drug that was used uh, in terms of uh, what we would ordinarily think of, like peyote and uh, stuff, was the datura, the um, jimson weed. And uh, this was generally used uh, at an initiation time. It was generally taken once in a lifetime or maybe twice in a lifetime. And it was taken when a youth, uh, I believe it was taken by both men and women, boys and girls. And it was taken when you reached the age of about 17 or 18. And it, there would be a kind of an initiation around it. And you would be given this uh, thing. Uh, it would apparently. Um, give visions, it would give hallucinations. Uh, it was during that time that a couple of different things would happen. One of the things that would happen was that during this vision, during these visions, you might have a kind of visionary experience. And very often, the kind of visionary experience would be that the spirit of an animal might come to you. And this would be uh, the kind of thing that it would give you power. You would form a kind of, in this altered state of consciousness, then some animal spirit would come to you and make you strong in that particular way. And you would go through life with this animal spirit as a helper. The other thing that would happen is that the older men of the village would take this time when you were all, uh, your mind had just been uh, opened up and you were having visions and everything to impart certain esoteric knowledge, certain secrets, certain ways of being, certain things that it was necessary to be a youth. And there was that kind of opening up that was done. And then you would go right in there and uh, say, OK, you've now finished with your childhood. You're now an adult. Here are the adult things you have to know. And it was done. I mean, the, 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 that Indian didacticism of how to teach somebody something, boy, I mean, that was staged. That way, they went right in at the right time, and they told somebody something. And that, that, that was how it was used. I don't think they used anything else, as far as I know. Um, that was it.